So I wanted to start out with some really, really big numbers, and we're pulling it up right now. And the first number is a billion trillion, and that's my reference point. That is the number of stars in the universe, a billion trillion. So just kind of imagine that number. The next number there, I don't know how to say it. It's 10 to the 28, if anyone knows how to say 10 to the 28. That's the number of bacteria on Earth, 10 to the 28. It's a lot. The next number under there is 10 to the 31. That's the number of viruses. And, and a, a little fun fact, this is a good fun fact for today. If you stretch those viruses end to end in a big long line, it would go 100 million light years. The next number is the number of bacteria that get infected every second. That's 10 to the 23. And the final number is 4 billion, which is how long bacteria have been around. So imagine an, an artificial intelligence system where you have 10 to the 23 calculations per second and run that for 4 billion years. And that's kind of what we're up against with bacteria. And into this, we put antibiotics, which is wonderful. It's like a miracle. All of a sudden, we can do all of these medical procedures that were not ever possible before. We can do surgeries that would have led to infections. We can have immune therapies. We can do therapies that will you know, weaken people's immune systems, and we're able to recover them if they get infected. And that's great. But it leads to resistance. And now we're in this period of antibiotic resistance. This is in the US. This is um, from the Centers for Disease Control, 2019. We're looking at about 3 million infections per year that are resistant to these antibiotics. These infections have some, they, have, they kind of have wonderful names, at least I think so. Like Acinetobacter baumani. Doesn't that sound good? Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Let's try that one, everyone. Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We have methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. We have vancomycin-resistant enterococci. They have these beautiful names, but they're obviously not so beautiful. They're causing all these deaths. And, and a lot of these, these deaths and these infections are occurring in hospitals. In the healthcare environment, we see about 2 million infections per year, about 100,000 deaths. That's where we are. What happens when these antibiotics run out? What happens when these infections take over and we no longer have any tools? That would lead us to this post-antibiotic era. And what does that look like? A simple procedure like a cesarean section, which is fairly considered fairly low risk. Suddenly, that risk equation changes because the antibiotics to protect that patient aren't, aren't available. Oncology, immune therapy, all of these risks, are, uh, the way we see the, the medical treatment and the risk profile, that changes. And an example of that, I have a, a friend whose uncle was sadly diagnosed with cancer, was given a treatment that would weaken his immune system, or, or was proposed a treatment that would weaken his immune system, but had a good chance of leading to remission. And he actually elected not to do the treatment. So he wasn't getting care in the US, he was getting care abroad, and he elected not to do it because the risk of infection was so high. That he said, you know what, I have a better chance for more quality time, quality life, if I don't pursue a treatment for my cancer because I'm pretty sure I'm going to get an infection. That's what a post-antibiotic era looks like, when these decisions and the medical care risk balance changes. And so is that kind of far off into the future? And this is from that CDC report, November 2019. This is Robert Redfield, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He says, stop referring to a post-antibiotic era. It's already here. You and I are living in a time when some miracle drugs no longer perform miracles, and families are being ripped apart by a microscopic enemy. The time for action is now, and we can be part of the solution. The UN had a General Assembly meeting on antimicrobial resistance in 2015. It's only one of four health-focused meetings they've ever had. So this is a huge global issue. And if we don't do something, if we don't take action, this is a report from the UK government, by 2050, they're estimating 10 million deaths annually caused by antimicrobial resistance. That would make it the leading cause of death in the world. It would make it the third or fourth leading cause of death in the United States. The total cost of that, $100 trillion from 2014 to then. That's about 3 to 4% of the global GDP. That's the burden of, of these illnesses. So what do we do about it? They're kind of the three Ps here. So the first is we want to preserve our antibiotics, and that is called antimicrobial stewardship. We want to make sure we're not using antibiotics inappropriately. We want to make sure you're using the right one at the right time. And that's sort of, that's in development, that's, that's moving out into the, the healthcare environment. It's tricky because we need every facility in the whole world to do this. And there are places internationally where you can walk into pharmacies and buy any antibiotic you want. So that makes it a challenge. There's pipeline. We need more antibiotics. And this is also a challenge. The business model around antibiotics 
for pharmaceuticals isn't good. Uh, recently, a pharmaceutical company went bankrupt, and they were focused on antibiotics. But I think the most important thing, and the thing we can all do, is we can prevent the infections from occurring in the first place. If we prevent an infection, we don't need the antibiotic. We don't use it. We preserve it. We save it. And we prevent the suffering of that infection. So where is the battleground for this? It's in the healthcare environment. That's where the people with the infections are coming, and that's where we're fighting the infection. So this is the hospital room, pretty standard hospital room. The green X's mark places where, after cleaning, pathogens were found in this hospital room. If I were a pathogen, you know, if we went and surveyed the Pseudomonas aeruginosa <laughs> and said, how would you like us to design? We're going to design an environment for you so you can spread and, and evolve. It would look a lot like this. They would say, well, why don't we put immune-compromised patients, patients with weakened immune systems, and we'll put them next to people who are infected. We'll put them in the same area. Let's make the environment really complicated and hard to clean, like all sorts of equipment. That's a good idea, right? And then we'll have a lot of people go in and out of that environment. That sounds good. And while we're doing that, why don't we, put, why don't we use about 30% of the antibiotics incorrectly? So, you know, if we get a chance to develop some resistance to that, that sounds like a pretty good environment, and that's really what we have. And it's by necessity, but that is what healthcare is. It's really kind of designed for the pathogens to spread. And what are our tools for fixing that? Mops, buckets, wipes. They really haven't changed. Like, our tools have really evolved, but the technology around them has not changed at all. That's not to criticize the healthcare workers. They go in there, and their job is to make the room look good. Their job is to take out the trash, strip the bed, make the bed, wipe up the orange juice on the floor or whatever else might be on the floor, clean that room, make it look fantastic, and they have sometimes 18 minutes to do it. And then recently, we've added a new job to them. We've said, okay, well, clean the room, make it look fantastic, you know, but also while you're at it, make the room pathogen-free. And of course, that's, that's a humanly impossible task. They don't have the tools to do that. And so, while the pathogens have evolved, our tools haven't. So technology is really our answer. We're not going to evolve fast enough. We're not going to evolve defenses to these, these organisms. But we do have technology. And this here is a picture of a germ-zapping robot. Doesn't that sound good? Germ-zapping robot. And what it does is it produces an energy that doesn't naturally occur on Earth. It's called ultraviolet C, a high-energy ultraviolet. Because that's never occur it doesn't occur naturally on Earth, it's filtered by the ozone layer, the bacteria in their 4 billion years and their 10 to the 23 infections per second, they've never seen this. And so it's very effective at, at killing the bacteria. So you can basically roll it into a room, put it in a position for about five minutes, it'll disinfect that room. By implementing this, we've seen reductions in the hospital-acquired infections, at the rate of infections at facilities. And we've done about 20 million rooms. And in doing the 20 million rooms, we've, we've learned a few things. And the first one is that the healthcare environment, hospitals, are really, really rough. They're really hard on equipment. Like you can see in the picture, there's a little dome on the top of the device. That took us a long time to figure out. We had it flat, like we wanted it flat, so you could store it easier, it's a little bit smaller. Flat makes sense, right? And we had a little sticker that said, you know, don't place anything on top of the, on the robot. And then, you know, and then you get like, and then someone sent us a picture of a coffee stain, you know, on the sticker. And then we found out people were putting boxes on top, and then we found out people were actually giving each other like sort of robot surfing rides <laughs> down the hospital. So we, we came up with the perfect arc and angle that there is no way you can set a coffee mug or, or a Starbucks cup on top of that that it doesn't fall off. But the robot's filled with things like that. There's bumpers, there's shocks, there's all this stuff, because the healthcare environment, when you introduce technology into healthcare, it's really rough on the technology. Another point is that dignity is what really creates change in the healthcare environment. So our robot operators are the EVS workers, the housekeepers. And they're kind of look, they can be looked down on. Not in all facilities, not in all places, but they can be looked down on. You know, they don't feel like they're part of the healthcare team. And then we come in, we introduce a technology for them. And all of a sudden, they're pushing this robot around. Maybe the, there was a news thing, and one of their colleagues was on the news, you know, as the new robot operator, germ zapping robots. But they sort of feel like they're now part of the team. They feel like, hey, you know, if you ask them what's your job, they don't say, I, I clean rooms. They say, I save lives. And that transformation is really important because they will then, if they see the, the chief of surgery walk into a room and not wash his hands, they'll say, hey, wait a minute. I just disinfected this room. What are you doing? And they'll stand up, and it's, it's really great. So that dignity is what really creates the change in a facility. Another thing we learned is when we started out, we were asking the wrong question. 
our question was, what's the best way to disinfect a room? Seems like a good question, right? We have these rooms, we have maybe an isolation room with a patient with C. diff. Oh, here's another good one. Clostridiotes difficile. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? Let's do that one too. Clostridiotes difficile. No. But you have a patient, and, you, and we, we we're going to just augment that clean there on isolation. We're going to add extra disinfection to there. And we did that, and it works. And we can show, you know, we've reduced the amount of Clostridiotes difficile in the room, but it doesn't really address the infection rate on the floor. That's because even though that patient was on isolation, that organism has escaped that room. And if we see one transmission of a, of a pathogen on a room, it means there's other people colonized on that floor. We've got to expand that disinfection. So we were asking the wrong question. Our question should have been, how do we disinfect a hospital? Which is a much bigger question. And that gets to the collective effort. We created these large programs of how are we going to disinfect every single discharge on a unit. If you want to bring the rate of infection down on an oncology unit or in the ICU, you can't just disinfect the isolation rooms. You've got to be disinfecting every room all the time. And that's a collective effort. That's the infection control. That's environmental services. That's nursing, all working together. And so we learned that. We thought, you know, oh, we're going to introduce a technology to disinfect a room better, and that'll be great. And we were, we were kind of wrong. It's, it's a bigger project than that. And so to close, I have another quote from Robert Redfield, the director of the CDC. And he says, we need to adopt aggressive strategies that keep germs away and keep the infections from occurring in the first place. So if you're in healthcare, I challenge you, think for a moment. What is your aggressive strategy here? If infection control brings up a new policy, do you embrace it? Or do you kind of, sometimes there's resistance because you're changing your workflow, right? What can you do that's an aggressive strategy to protect not only your patients, but yourself? These germs can travel home, your family. How do you keep the germs away? And if you're a patient or if or if a loved one's a patient, you have permission from the director of the CDC to adopt an aggressive strategy. If you see someone come in the room and not wash their hands, you, it's not even permission. He says, we need to. You have an order from the director of the CDC to be aggressive. It's OK. And it's not selfish. Because if, if you can prevent that infection, that saves the antibiotic for someone else, and that reduces the risk of everyone around you. And so together with this collective effort, we can hopefully reduce these and prove the UK report wrong. Let's, let's prove it wrong that there won't be 10 million deaths a year in 2050. Thank you.